Good afternoon, everyone, and can I welcome everyone to uh, today's meeting of the Cabinet at Suffolk County Council. Um, just a few things we just need to run through. Uh, this meeting is being webcast live and will be available to watch subsequently on the County Council's website. Uh, members of the public and the press may also record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded, provided due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance, in line with the County Council's published guidance. Uh, there are no plans for a fire drill today, so if the alarm does sound, can we please leave the chamber, follow the fire exit signs to the rear of the chamber, and fire evacuation instructions can be found on page four of the agenda. Uh, and if I could just ask everyone to make sure their mobile phones are either off or on silent. And also, um, could I ask everyone just to turn down the volume on their computers as well? Because um, last time we had a sort of uh, an echo chamber of pinging when an email went out to all councillors. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any, please? There are no apologies for absence received to, for today's meeting. Thanks very much. Um, next item is declarations of interest and dispensation by cabinet members. Do we have any? None received. Thanks very much. Okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting, which are laid out in our uh, papers. Agenda right. Oh, there are no minutes in my papers. Oh, yes, they are. I'm sorry, I've gone to the wrong page. Page five. Uh, agenda item five, page five, my apologies. Um, so they're on page five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Um, is everyone happy with those? And I sign them as a true record of the meeting. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. I'll do that after the meeting. Okay, next we move on to public questions. Uh, we have two public questions. Uh, the first one is from Mr. Adam Robertson, who's um, not here today. Um, so I will read out the question and then ask uh, Councillor West to respond. Uh, so the question is, when will Suffolk County Council agree to a second speed and volume survey along London Road... I'll get this wrong. <laughs> Gislam, thank you. Um, after the police caught one car doing 104 miles an hour after doing speed checks. Councillor West. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hicks. Um, London Road, Gislam has a speed limit of 40 miles an hour and speed enforcement is the responsibility of the police. Clearly, any vehicle travelling at 104 miles an hour would be an un acceptable speed in a 40 mile an hour speed limit and would be a matter for the police to deal with and enforce. It's note, noted that this has been raised following a check that the police had undertaken, although in talking to the police they've confirmed they've actually no record of any vehicle travelling at over 100 mile an hour uh, on this section of road. However, any concerns over speed enforcement should be directed to the local safer neighbourhood team or the police's safe cam team. Although the County Council uh, can carry out traffic surveys across the county to provide ongoing monitoring, um, unfortunately we don't have a permanent counter in this particular location. There was an ad hoc count with speed results here in October 2020. This showed average speeds of 37 miles an hour. Uh, at the moment, given the existing police um, activity over enforcement, it's not considered uh, useful for County Council to carry out additional surveys at this particular time. Thank you very much. And as Mr Robertson is not in attendance, there'll be no supplementary question today. Okay, question number two is from Mrs Prima Dorai to Councillor Becky Hofsenberger. And Mrs Dorai again is not in attendance, so I'll read the question. Uh, the care sector in Suffolk is currently at crisis point with a serious staff shortage and a huge backlog of care packages which we have not experienced in many years. What will the council do to ease these pressures, especially regarding paying the sector the true cost of care? Councillor Halsenberger. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and um, I'm sure Prima is watching, so thank you, Prima, for your question. Um, 
Before I answer the question, uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank all of those who work in the care for the job they're doing to continue to look after the most vulnerable in our county and, the, and to help them live independent lives. The question touches on an important issue and the care market will never be sustainable until it can offer pay rates that match those in other sectors, particularly retail and hospitality, who often compete for the same staff. We know recruitment and retention has been difficult in care and that the effects of the first pandemic and then the reopening of other sectors of the economy and the subsequent competition for staff has seen pay, has seen pay, pay rates rise. This is a national issue, not one that's unique to Suffolk and we will need national solutions. However, there is much we have done and continue to do in Suffolk to support care providers. We continue to work closely with care providers through one-to-one -one relationships. They have nominated service development and contract managers. The support through our help desk and the more in-depth support and intervention we give providers who are struggling from time to time. We have stepped this up through the pandemic and worked with care providers through the care cell and other mechanisms. We have jointly with Norfolk County Council invested eight million in developing skills in the workforce. We have provided extra funding for providers in COVID through Suffolk, through Suffolk wide, a 2% top up in 2021-22 above the above and beyond the national funding such as infection control funds that we have channeled to providers. However, we cannot get away from the issue of the price that we pay to, for care and the level of pay for care staff. We recognise that the issue of recruitment and retention are not new and that COVID pandemic has exasperated problems that were already there. In setting prices for care, we have to steer a course that balances the need for fund, to fund care providers at a level that allows them to pay their staff fairly and one that is affordable to the council, given the level of funding we have, we have and other pressures on our budget. This is not always easy, but during the recent years, we have increased our care prices at a level that has allowed providers to increase the pay greater than the rate of inflation. For instance, 4% was funded for care inflation for this year compared to 2.2 national living wage increase. This was not an isolated example. We have taken this approach for many years. In the end, we can do what we can afford in Suffolk, but this is a national problem and will require national solutions. We will work as a council to lobby the government with regards to a fairer fund funding settlement for social care in general. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Hasberg. And as we said, Mrs Dora is not in attendance, so there's no supplementary questions. So we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is agenda item five, which is the standing item, uh, which is the update from scrutiny, Chairman. Uh, we have Councillor Graham Newman here today uh, on behalf of uh, Councillor Ladd. Councillor Newman. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and uh, indeed you have got the written report in front of you. Uh, Education, Children and Services Scrutiny Committee was held on the 9th of September. Um, we had a pretty thorough meeting that day discussing um, the school travel policy. Um, a number of things came out of that, really. I think I'd like to point out particularly 2D, uh, where there's been considerable enhancement of the application's website over the past 12 months, uh, which has made it pretty, um, you know, it'd be difficult for a parent to make an application for school travel without realising that you need to apply to your nearest school if you wish to have free school travel and you live more than three miles from a school. And that has actually produced a, a, a big reduction in the number of people who are appealing decisions. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to 2J, uh, where, and I think you'll hear later on uh, this afternoon, um, the possibility of, of using the bus back better strategy to improve some aspects of home to school travel. And uh, in particular, um, item L there, um, I believe in last, in the previous um, council, some initiative was taken with the Department for Education about the fact that more choice had been provided in education by the provision of free schools and academies, um, often making more spaces available in specific areas. We seem to have given the public that um, uh, sort of choice, but we, what we haven't done is to support that with transport um, options. Um, is it possible for that dialogue to be reopened along those lines, and possibly again in conjunction uh, with Bus Back Better? Now, the main scrutiny committee met on the 30th of September, 
Um, again, your, the recommendations there are clearly laid out, but I think um, uh, talking with Councillor Ladd, he particularly wanted me to bring to your attention um, item 6B, where uh, the feeling of the committee was there was still some uncertainty about uh, new ways of working following the COVID uh, pandemic, and staff seem to be sort of unclear around that, and uh, they're saying this should be prioritised uh, for the benefit of staff's well-being and mental health, and particularly those who've had to sort of deal with difficult customers at home, you know, when you've got your dog barking or perhaps a child crying out or whatever in the background, uh, not easy for, for everybody to work from home. So uh, that was the point that was made there. Happy to take any questions, sir. Thank, thank you very much for those and, and thank you for the comprehensive report, um, which we'll obviously pick up on. Happy to open it up to Cabinet colleagues if anyone wishes to comment on any of the items uh, that have been brought up. Yeah, Councillor Smith. Um, as uh, Councillor Newman has said, on the Education and uh, Children's Services Scrutiny Committee, on page 2J, does refer to Bus Back Better. And um, I very much agree with Councillor uh, Newman that uh, the opportunity we have in front of us over the next few months needs to be taken to see if we can uh, improve school transport options. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for that, Councillor Newman. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item, which is the uh, first item today, which is the Suffolk Local Access Forum Annual Report. I'd like to welcome Mr Barry Hall uh, to the Chamber. Thank you for joining us today. But before we start, I'd like to hand over to Councillor Paul West to introduce the item. Councillor West. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Chair. I, too, would like to welcome um, Mr Barry Hall, who I'll be handing over to in a moment. Mr Hall is the Chair of the... Suffolk Local Access Forum and we'll be giving the report for 2020, 2021. But before I hand over, just a few words about the Access Forum. The County Council as the Highway Authority has established a local access forum um, that's in line with Section 94 of the Countryside and Rights of Way Act uh, in 2000. The members of the forum are independent and represent those involved with access to the countryside, including landowners, um, general users, and those with conservation interests. Uh, the role of the Access Forum is to provide strategic advice on the improvement of public access to land in their area for the purposes of open air recreation and the enjoyment of the area, and to other such matters as may be prescribed um, by the relevant um, act referred to a moment ago. So members will have um, had chance to read the written report, agenda item six, but I'm now, I'm now pleased to hand over to Mr Hall to give um, his presentation of the report and then following that we can refer back to you chair and then perhaps have questions from members. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you all for letting me come here again. <laughs> and last year, as we know, it was virtual and I found that very difficult. So it's nice to be here in person. If you look at our report, you'll see it probably looks very much like it has for the last few years. I think it's basically because all these big energy schemes have taken an awful lot of time. Size will see inquiry hopefully is now closed and we were continually pressing for the resolution of several access issues within the, the um, EF, uh, within, within the inquiry, particularly a resolution to the alternatives for Bridewell 19, which is going to be closed for 10, 12 years, who knows, and also particularly for getting the coast path off the beach and onto the top of the new sea defences which they want to build. It would be much better up there, although you still have the option to go on the beach, but if there is erosion, then we've got already got a proper footpath on top of the sea defences. Uh, we've also had a subcommittee looking at energy schemes, particularly the Sunica Solar Farm Programme, which is over in the Newmarket area. We, we put in um, a very heavy response to that and it wasn't until I raised at our local regional local access forum meeting with the chairs of other things that Cambridgeshire realised this was going on 
And so Cambridgeshire Local Access Forum followed our lead and also put in a robust defence of rights of way and the loss of amenity with this very large solar farm. There are now several other solar farms around coming up. There are several in the Bramford area linked to the expansion of the substation in that area. And will we keep all these schemes under review and where they think they have an impact on rights of way and also visual amenity, we will continue to submit our proposals and our objections to the relevant authorities. Uh, network rail lingers on despite a uh, resolution of the Transport and Works Act inquiry well, well over a year ago now. There's been let, very little movement on closing the ones they're allowed to close and also looking for alternative routes on some which there are some other issues. Gypsy Lane carries on for many years. That has happened. You, you hear it every year. We're waiting for Network Rail to close that by providing an alternative route which has been agreed at, by a, a planning decision, a planning inquiry in 2019. Nothing has happened. We're also concerned that Network Rail are replacing styles, not with kissing gates, which would make it easier for people to cross the line where there is the proper visibility, but with metal styles. Now, that's not really accessible for people with limited mobility and for other issues. We are pleased that um, Highways England are actually now getting involved in looking at the problem where rights of way cross the A14, there are areas at Trimley and in other places where they're looking at with the County Council of alternatives to, to stop these very dangerous crossings. I mean, if you drive along the A14, you see the sign saying, pedestrian crossing, you know, and you're going 70 miles an hour, and if somebody's trying to cross it, well, I've never seen anybody trying, <laughs> but we don't. Uh, they're looking at improvements also to the cop dot interchange, which could approve, improve the accessibility between Ipswich and the Belstead areas, and also the, a, a revisit of the Worsted Interchange on the A137 will hopefully Im improve the crossing there in, into Bobbitt's Lane. We have a planning and development group which is starting to look at big planning applications or proposals, particularly the County Council ones, which we're very pleased to be asked to to look at the ones you, these new um, garden village sites you are proposing, and we will continue to have an oversight of those. And we've also met with the planning officers for the districts, and they've laid out their um, proposals of how they're looking at big, big sites. And we're going to take this into account, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll produce a sort of bullet point thing to send to districts saying when you're looking at a big development of so many houses can you consider these things like we don't want rights of way restricted by fences into just a 1.8 metre surface corridor we'd like a green space a wider green space so that you can flow through your development out into the wider countryside the other good thing is that now all sections of the England Coast Path in Suffolk have now been published by Natural England and we, we have responded to all these proposals very positively because it will give a much improved walking route along the whole coast of Suffolk including the estuaries. There are one or two places where there have been objections and these will be, uh, will be considered by the inspectorate and in due course a decision will be made. What is good is that the development of this path, Natural England will pay for all the work to do the development and I understand they've also approved paying for a development officer for the County Council to get this work underway and work with contractors to do the surfacing, the signing and whatever else. The only blip on the horizon is that we need to lobby Natural England to 
for a longer term maintenance grant for this work. For once it's been done, it's fine, but as you know, things deteriorate over time and that will then impact on your budget. And if the, we can persuade the Natural England to put money into that maintenance budget for the future, so far, so good. And the next thing will be to look at marketing this. I mean, we know the Southwest Coast Path brings in huge numbers of people, but because it's being marketed nationally, we're looking perhaps at a more regional path, the Norfolk coast, the, the, uh, the Suffolk coast, possibly Essex, and, and getting that promoted as a regional route to bring people in to walk it over a period of time, and that will bring it, money into the economy of Suffolk. We're very pleased to see that funding has been given for the Discovering Suffolk project and enable many people to use our net, network our rights away network either as a visitor or even as a local who are not aware of it and that we look forward to the Suffolk Walking Festival taking place in 2022. I've already mentioned about our regional access forum meetings with the other chairs and our last one a, a very similar issue came out it was the fact that with Covid and the lockdown many more people were using their local rights of way which again impacted unfortunately on maintenance you know had more footfall people were straying off the main path and there are other issues such as parking on verges or in farm gateways which when people went to go out in the countryside but it has, does mean that what we've always said is that people be able to get out into their local environment it helps their well-being, their physical and mental well-being. And uh, we, we hope that you will recognise this, that, that, there's, that it, it, it's cheaper to maintain a footpath than spend money having to put, give, give people, what should we say, uh, medication or... or, or Cancelling for, for, for other problems if it can be done just by walking in the fresh air. Finally, I think I'd like to thank Andrew Wooden and his Rights Away team and David Falk and his Green Access team for their help and involvement with the Local Access Forum. And also for you, the County Council, for your support for the improvement and maintenance and promotion of our well used County Council Rights of Way which also brings significant income into the county of Suffolk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I just thank you for all you do? You thanked everyone else, but I think we need to thank you as well for all that you do. And uh, thank you for covering off so much work in a short space of time but, uh, today. Uh, but thank you very much for coming to us and, and talking us through the work that's gone on. Um, uh, Councillor West, is there anything you want to add before I open it up to colleagues? Um, no, apart from to, to uh, join with you and thank Mr Hall for everything he's done in the last year and also um, to echo Mr Hall's words to thank the officer team for the, for the work that they continuously do uh, during the year as well. Thank you very much. So, I'm happy to open up. Yep. Councillor Smith and Councillor Rand. Uh, just a quick comment from me, Chairman, if I may, and I'd like to echo the thanks to Mr Hall and the Forum, especially about the remarks he made on Sizewell C. I represent the Blything Division, which includes the parish of Theberton and Eastbridge, and Eastbridge is the nearest dwellings to what will be the uh, working site at Sizewell C. So we are very concerned about uh, the future of footpaths, and uh, I wholly support all the representations you have made to the Planning Inspectorate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rout. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And can I add to the, the crescendo of thanks for, to, to, to Mr Hall and the, um, the Local Access Forum? Um, your work's very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'll start by just uh, welcoming your remarks, I think, around how spending or maintenance of our natural environment um, can offset costs elsewhere. And I think it's, it's, it's something we don't necessarily talk about enough. Um, 
but it's something highlighted, I, I believe, in the Das Gupta report earlier this year that, that, that enjoyment of our, our natural environment can really um, minimise uh, the strain on, on central government and indeed local authorities. But I'd, I'd really like to welcome your work around the um, nationally significant infrastructure projects coming forward in, in the county, in particular size we'll see, um, SPR and the, the Sunica solar farm. I think their um, prominence in, in, in your report today highlights the, the wider point we keep making about the, the cumulative impact of all of these schemes coming forward, um, in particular the, the, the impact on our environment, but also um, the enjoyment of and access to our, our countryside. And I was, I was really pleased to hear you mention visual amenity. Um, because I think that's a, that's a key issue, and I'm looking across the, the chamber at Councillors Finch and, and Faircloth Mutton, who know um, all too well the, the potential impacts of the um, proposed new pylon runs in, in South Suffolk and indeed North South um, from Norwich to, to Essex. Um, and, and on that note, I just wanted to mention to you the launch of Offset, a new um, MP, regional MPs group launched today, which is the Offshore Electricity Grid Task Force, which will, um, and they'll be working across um, East Anglia to look at minimising onshore infrastructure and moving as much of that as they can um, offshore. So I think feeding into that group through your local MPs would be, um, would be a, a, a really useful um, mechanism for you. My question really is, is, as a local access forum, do you feel um, properly consulted by both National Grid and the and the energy um, developers themselves. And how have you found that process through lockdown? Have you found the, the sort of the online engagement exercises better or, 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 or worse to the, the in-person sessions? Well, certainly when Sizewell got underway, we had quite a lot of presentations from them at our meetings. And obviously as it got to the inquiry stage, they obviously drifted away and we had to pick up stuff from the planning inspectorate or who sent information that another, because Sizewell didn't just stop at what it had to, every time, every so often they came up with another consultation as you very well know. I mean the latest one was about the temporary desalinisation project which d didn't have up to some implications but it just shows they didn't get all the ducks in a row before they started. Um, we have found it more difficult to, when we have working online to, to get information um, and having to more rely on being relayed by our co the, my friends behind me, really, to us that, oh, this has happened, or this is... And, and then, so we have to... Sometimes we've been playing catch-up, quite honestly, and certainly the fact that because of lockdown, none of the inquiries were actually in person. It was very difficult to, to monitor what was going on. So uh, we, we now await with trepidation, I think, um, some of the, the conclusions from the inquiries. Um, and hopefully that some of, many of the points we put to the planning inspectorate will have been taken up and would, will be worked into whatever, if there is a, a, deci a, a decision in favour, that there will certainly be conditions on things like the alternative right away way IT and those sort of things, which we've, we've, and also legacy, which we've asked for a legacy of, of, of you know, if, the, if you're taking something away for 10 years, you want there's something better given back at the end of time, you know, so we're looking for something very good on the legacy issue through the section 106 agreements thank you very much any other cabinet colleagues wish to come in no happy to open it up to other colleagues and first up is uh, councillor vigo de galidoro put the microphone on so you can hear me mr hall thank you very much for all the work you're doing with the uh, local access forum. I served on the board's local access forum for a couple of years and it's amazing just how many issues that are uh, thrown up. Um, disabled access to a lot of these uh, paths is a major issue. You mentioned earlier um, about the kissing gates instead of styles. 
And that's something that people in Castle Colville have asked me about very recently. Um, they can't get access to across certain areas because their styles and they're too old now to climb over the styles. And I just wondered how many we have of those in the county and uh, what progress you feel you are able to make on them. I've no idea how many styles. I know ones I've used, my wife has problems with her knees and she has trouble climbing over some of the styles. Some are very rickety. I mean, um, I, I'm not too sure whether they're la landowner responsibility or the county councils. I think they're probably landowners. Uh, in theory, if there isn't stock in the field, there'll be no need for a style. And if there has to be a style, a kissing cake is far better, provided it's a properly sized one. I've come across some homemade ones where you have to go. <laughs> you could never get a push chair or, or a wheelchair through them. Um, I know that the rights away officers out on the ground are always obviously checking on these things and if they find them, they, they will, will, will do something. But I, I mean, really the aim is to try and get, if styles are needed, then they should be kissing gates if possible. If the style is redundant, take it out. I mean, quite often you have seen gates and styles, and the gates are always open now because there's no stock, so you don't need the style, so that's all overgrown, that's fine. But I, I agree with you, you know, to make countryside access has got to be made as friendly as possible for all users, no matter who they are. I think it's probably the, the live, livestock still require more than a kissing gate to make sure oh, yes, livestock yes. is uh, safe. I mean, the other, apart problem, from that. the other problem, we have uh, a member of our forum who, who farms in the, um, in the sort of Westerfield, that area, of the Finn Valley, and she has great problems with dogs worrying her sheep and, and killing her sheep. You know, because people don't respect the fact that there is livestock in the field, they've been asked to keep their dog on a lead because I, they don't, or they use these retractable leads and the dog go, you know. Uh, I think uh, the new countryside code which has come in, I think makes it m much more clear about dog ownership, but it still says sh should be kept under control. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin, you were next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, uh, Mr Hall, you uh, mentioned the problems that some people have had with uh, uh, unhelpful parking of people who are using uh, footpaths in particular. Um, clearly, we want people to uh, go for walks. We want people to use footpaths. But it's going to be better for everyone's health and the environment and indeed for local residents as well if they can walk directly from uh, their ha home or indeed can uh, reach there by public transport. So um, my question is, have you had any talks with either bus companies or the rail company about uh, access to uh, public rights of way from railway stations or bus stops? Certainly not with buses, but there is uh, something called the East Suffolk Rail Partnership, is which one of our members belongs to and they do promote walks from the railway stations along the East Suffolk line uh, which obviously is you know you can either go to a station do the walk and come back to that or, or walk to the next station uh, and and that's I'm not sure whether that operates on the other rail lines in Suffolk but certainly the East Suffolk one has this very strong rail partnership which uh, would, would be good if they could get it going on some other lines I know Felix, so might be difficult with all the container trains, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I also say thank you, Mr Hall, for all you and your team have done. Uh, I know a number of your members of your committee. Um, I would just like to say thank you for what you do as Vice Chairman of the um, Dedhamdale AOMV in South Suffolk and um, we're very proud of that particular area and, um, and we have been doing actually in, in putting in more 
um, um, kissing gates because actually there's more cattle coming in the Stour Valley, um, which is a, a nice place, a nice scene to be seen. I just want to ask you, is there anything you think we should be doing? Because I'm a bit staggered, as and I'm sure Mr. Councillor Newman might say the same thing, that the um, need of market asset from Network Rail has still not been solved. I was uh, one of uh, Councillor West's predecessors, as was Graham, and um, I cannot believe this is still not solved. Or whether we should be having a sort of a mass march into Network Rail headquarters to try and do this, but what are, what are your suggestions? Well, I have written in the last year to Network Rail, um, asking them to get their finger out, basically, and I know that uh, Mr Wooden is following that up and perhaps might be able to give us more of an update. Councillor French, I'm surprised you are shocked that it took taken Network Rail so long. Um, but it is their project. It's run into engineering difficulties with the alternative route, which is through the culvert, you'll recall. Um, there are engineering challenges there, partly because of, um, should we say, difficult negotiations with the landowner. So it's not been a perfect relationship there and that has slowed the project down. Nevertheless, they are leading it and paying our expenses where, where we're involved. I think the, the, um, the one good thing I can say is the level crossing remains open so the public still have a very accessible route through over the level crossing. Of course, that in itself is a, has been a problem. There was um, a death on there, as you know, uh, a few years ago, resulting in a £4 million fine to Network Rail, which was the impetus to them to close the crossing. The crossing is safe because there's a speed limit imposed on it. If it wasn't safe, it wouldn't be open. So we can hold the line uh, whilst uh, Network Rail resolve the remaining issues. Issues I have made progress, and I would hope to have uh, something decisive to say by the end of this calendar year, one way or the other. Thank you very much. You heard it in here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Lockington, you were next. Thank you, Chair. Um, just as I put my hand up, one of our fellow councillors up there um, mentioned uh, disabled people. And I do feel we need to do a lot more um, about making footpaths accessible for people with disability. And now speaking as a grandma, then actually I can push my grandchild in a wheelchair or in a pushchair. So, um, you know, it will make it easier for everybody. And during COVID, yes, we could go out walking for miles, the ones of us who can do that. In the countryside, it was lovely. But disabled people who may have a very good electric Bucky, they could get out in, but they couldn't in the countryside because the path was not there for them. So I think if we could look at Suffolk and see if they're in certain areas of Suffolk, can make paths where people with disability in wheelchairs can get out and take part of the open life as the rest of us can. Is that something you, you have a team that look into? We've, we've always looked for accessibility, and I know that there are areas in the county where this has been uh, accessible paths have been built. Particularly, there's, a, there's one in Milden Hall, which is going out past the new development. That, that we, we looked at that as a group a couple of years ago when we were allowed to visit places. <laughs> and, uh, what had been done there, and it'd be nice to, if there. As you say, you can't make every path accessible, but if, if some are accessible from main centres of population or from where you can get to on a bus or, or in a, a taxi which can take you in your wheelchair, it would be very good. But again, and it's down to you lot, I suppose, it's, it's the finance. You know, your budget's constrained and what has to be done with the budgets goes that way. And the budget, although I know you are very good at 
given the rights of way, you, you, you recognise them and you, you do recognise them in your budgets, and which, for which we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Councillor Newman. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, just very pleased to confirm to Mr Hall, as a um, board member of the East Suffolk Lions Community Rail Partnership, that the walks booklet does indeed include the Felixstowe branch, and in fact I think there are six walks between Ipswich and Felixstowe which cover a, a wide area of countryside and uh, indeed paths that interact with the A14 in places you were earlier referred to. Okay, I don't have any other hands up for anyone else that wishes to come in. So, Councillor West, can I just ask you to remind Cabinet what we're being asked to decide today, please? Um, uh, on page 13, at paragraph two, um, we're being asked to accept the uh, Suffolk Local Access Forum Annual Report 2021 um, and address the report's recommendations and actions that the Council is taking to address those, which we've had a full discussion about. So, Thank you very much. You. So, Cabinet, if you're in favour of the recommendation that's just been read out, could I ask you to have a show of hands, please? Thank you very much. That's unanimous. And thank you again, uh, Mr Hall, for joining us today and for all the work you do. Thank you. OK. Um, we now move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is agenda item seven, uh, which is the Bus Back Better Bus Service Improvement Plan. I'll now hand over to Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Chairman. On the 15th of June this year, Cabinet confirmed the Council's commitment to take forward implementation of an enhanced partnership scheme for bus services in Suffolk. This met the first deadline set in the National Bus Strategy. That National Bus Strategy, which is also known as Bus Back Better, was launched by Government in March as their approach delivering a step change in local public transport provision. It's designed to complement the three core pillars of the government's Build Back Better plan for sustainable economic growth, those pillars being infrastructure, skills and innovation. Bus Back Better sets out a process to improve partnership working between local transport authorities and bus operators to deliver better bus services and increase patronage. It presents a radical shift in how bus services are planned and organised across England, that's England with the exception of London, with local transport authorities taking on a much greater role to address the current fragmented approach to network planning and delivery. The current operating model for the bus industry in England, again not including London, has resulted in a skills gap with many local transport authorities in relation to planning and managing bus services. Fundamental to responding to the National Bus Service will be our plan for Suffolk to build both capacity and capability within this council to ensure that we have the right resources in the right place to guarantee that this initiative is successful. The preparation of the Bus Service Improvement Plan is the first stage in this partnership process and the time frame for delivering the Bus Service Improvement Plan is very tight. By the end of this month, each local transport authority will need to publish a local bus service improvement plan. Each plan will need to be updated annually and be reflected in the authority's local transport plan and in other relevant local plans, such as local cycling and walking infrastructure plans. It's expected that local transport authorities will implement ambitious bus, bus priority schemes and plans. And plans must be developed in collaboration with local bus operators, community transport bodies and local businesses, as well as our residents. In a recent letter, to all local transport leaders, Baroness Veer of Norbiton, the Minister for Roads, Buses and Places, highlighted the crucial role that enhanced bus services can play in delivering societal and economic goals. And she identified, and here I quote from her letter, buses support the local economy by improving connectivity 
and reducing congestion, which affect all road users and cost urban economies at least £11 billion a year. Buses can be key to levelling up, with users disproportionately drawn from less advantaged social groups and places. Uh, Lady Veer also emphasised that buses should not be seen or promoted only as transport for those without an alternative. There's clear evidence that they can be made attractive enough to draw people away from their cars, for example, by installing bus priority lanes, reviewing parking policies, and increasing frequency of services. For this reason, buses are also vital in ensuring the economy meets its target for net zero carbon emissions. Now, Chairman, our first bus service improvement plan sets out how we propose to implement our ambition to deliver improved services that will support resilient, connected and sustainable communities across Suffolk, help meet the, transi the transition to net zero and create economic opportunities that benefit everyone. In parallel to the preparation of the bus service improvement plan is the work being undertaken to develop the enhanced partnership and the first enhanced partnership scheme. We're working towards meeting the deadline set by government of having an enhanced partnership scheme in place by April next year. And this partnership will form the statutory delivery mechanism for implementing the proposals identified in the bus service implement improvement plan. Now today, I present the proposals that form the basis of our bus service improvement plan and our funding ask to central government. It should be noted that the Department for Transport has recognised the challenge faced by local transport authorities in preparing proposals and estimating associated costs. They have highlighted through working sessions and general feedback that the detail in bus service improvement plans is expected to be outline in nature, with the main purpose to get each local transport authority considering the issues and possible solutions for their area. The Department for Transport has indicated that further guidance on the funding template that accompanies the bus service improvement plan is imminent. Indeed, we are expecting to hear from government this week. So, we're requesting that Cabinet agree to, de to delegate the final development, including costings, and the submission of the bus service improvement plan to the Executive Director for Growth Highways and Infrastructure in consultation with the Cabinet member, who happens to be me. Uh, this will enable the Department for Transport end of October deadline for publishing the first bus service improvement plan to be met. A third Cabinet paper on this subject will be presented on the enhanced partnership arrangements, probably in March next year. This will provide details on the progress of transforming the bus service improvement plans into our first enhanced partnership plan and accompanying enhanced partnership scheme. I will be testing everybody on all these <laughs> later on. Uh, this will be in advance of, the April 20, uh, of April 2022, when we have to demonstrate to government that our enhanced partnership is in place. It's important to emphasise the point made in both the Cabinet paper presented in June and today's Cabinet paper that there is a significant risk if we don't deliver our bus service improvement plan to government by the end of this month. The government have made it clear that only local transport authorities and operators who meet the requirements of either progressing an enhanced partnership or franchise arrangement for bus services will continue to receive the COVID-19 bus services support grant and be eligible to receive the reformed bus service operators grant, which is currently paid to operators. And any new funding schemes, any new funding streams, including those announced as part of the government's three billion pounds national bus strategy budget. I can assure you, we will meet the government's deadline. On a particularly positive note, I've been encouraged by the extent of partnership and collaborative working that has already taken place across a wide range of stakeholders. 
including operators of all scales, including community transport providers, our district and borough council officers, representatives of SALC, the Suffolk Association of Local Councils, covering town and parishes, the Department for Work and Pensions, and passenger user groups. Whilst the preparation of the first bus service improvement plan for Suffolk does not require statutory consultation, by bringing together such a diverse group of stakeholders early in the process sets the right tone and foundation for partnership working in the coming months and years. And finally, Chairman, I'd also like to note my thanks to all the councillors, and some of them are in this chamber now, who attended the cross-party workshop that was held last month and chaired by my colleague, Councillor Alexander Nicholl. It was reassuring to see the collegiate approach taken by everybody at that session. And moving forward, we must and will continue to work in this way to enable transformational change for bus services to be delivered across Suffolk. Chairman, I commend this paper and its recommendation to colleagues. Thank you very, thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Okay, happy to open it up to other colleagues who wish to come in. Yes, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and thank you, uh, Councillor Smith, for bringing this forward. And I, I welcome, welcome this paper and this initiative uh, as a, a very important uh, move forward in terms of improving our bus services. Um, I note the suggestions um, for attracting people out of their cars uh, and back onto buses. Uh, and that's, this, is, of course, is the crucial flip side to um, creating a better network and a more usable network. Uh, uh, and I noted in um, point 75, 75 on page, forgive me, page 37, that there is the suggestion of bringing in lower and simpler fares, uh, particularly for young people. And I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the plans uh, to provide uh, the incentive through lower fares should our bid uh, for funding be acceptable. Uh, Chairman, uh, th 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 thank you for that comment, Councillor Reid. Um, there are in the paper uh, various proposals which go from A to Q, and I didn't want to go through all of those because I thought I was already speaking quite long enough. But of course, one of those does cover low lower fares and interconnectivity of tickets. We need to do all we can to make uh, bus services as attractive as possible and help to provide that alternative to using the car. Um, and this is one that I will be very keen on um, developing, but we're not quite at the stage of being able to make policy proposals yet. They will come in the final cabinet paper. Thank you very much. Any other cabinet colleagues wish to come in? Nope. Okay. Happy to open it up to others. Yep. Quick hands have gone up. Councillor Martin first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, I want to um, agree with and strengthen what uh, Councillor Reid was just saying. Um, for, first of all, can I say that I think that the collegiate approach that this council is taking is absolutely the right one. Uh, I think uh, working uh, in conjunction with the bus companies and with the people uh, who represent the demand and other local authorities is absolutely the right way to go, and I'd, I'd like to congratulate Councillor Smith for doing that. Um, I, uh, however, I well remember uh, John Prescott's Rural Bus Initiative, which uh, I was on this council at the time, um, and uh, it mainly involved uh, having a lot of additional buses rumbling across the countryside with nobody on board. Um, and that is not actually helpful. Um, so surely one of the main planks of any bus back better uh, plan has to be to stimulate demand, and as you yourself say here, uh, getting young people to start using or continue to use bus buses uh, is absolutely central to that. If people start getting their own cars, uh, then it becomes much more difficult to then attract them out of them. Um, in which case, can I suggest to you that 25% is actually not enough? Currently, if you are a teenager living in Suffolk and you have cause to visit London on a regular basis, you can get a card, you can get a young person's travel card, which enables you to travel anywhere in London with a 50% discount. So Suffolk teenagers can get a 50% discount in London, but when they're traveling in their own county, they can only get a 25% discount. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that I know the level of discount that it should be, but can I ask whether, as part of the partnership and as part of the work going forward for the plan, uh, you are going to investigate the possibility of different levels of discount, not just sticking with 25%? Uh, I'm grateful to Councillor Martin for his kind comments. But of course, there's always that word, however, which comes in, and then one realises that the comments have finished. But uh, actually, I don't disagree with you. At this stage, nothing is set. This is the stage to make suggestions. I'm not going to say that we'll do it. What I will say is that we will consider what you have to say. And I do note the disparity between the 25 here and the 50% in London. And I will ask officers to factor that into the discussions and the thinking that they'll have to do in the forthcoming six months. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Councillor Chanchi. Okay, um, perfect, you could hear me now. So, an admission, um, I'm a car, taxi or walk kind of girl. So, if you can convince me to get out of my car, I haven't been on a bus since 1987, and if you can convince me to get out of my car and get on a bus, you're on to a winner. And I'll tell you the reasons why I don't get a bus. So, the first thing is safety issues. Um, being in the town, it's not quite the same as rural problems and buses. So they come along, but you've got to wait at a bus stop and you've got to get off at a bus stop and then you've got to walk from that bus stop. And I don't like that idea, I'm afraid. So um, I prefer taxi if it's late at night. They don't come often enough. I'm very busy. If I had to spend time waiting to get a bus to go into town and then a bus coming back and then perhaps another bus to go somewhere else, it takes up too much of my time and time is money. So if you think of professional people, what they have to do in a day, as well as council and perhaps their own business, it's, it's time consuming. So it needs to be uber reliable. Now, because I haven't been on a bus, I can't say about the comfort. Years ago when I was on a bus, for me, it wasn't very comfortable. Um, it just didn't fit what I needed. I don't know, there might be Wi-Fi on there now. I have no idea. So I'm a bit ignorant on that score. But what I want to do is as a woman, express um, and I'm going to get my my um, old age bus pass in January uh, so you probably yeah so you probably don't want to attract people like me you want people who are going to pay properly but um, uh, I don't even know whether I'll use it when I get my bus pass so I'm a hard customer which leads me to my question with your passenger focus group how many were there who who are they where are they based and are they going to be able to feed back enough um, on the things that they want to see to get them out of their cars possibly more often if they do use the bus sometimes? Well, thank you for your comments, and I, I think we understand them. And officers behind me are listening carefully to what is being said today, because as I say, we have this nearly six-month period where we will be developing plans. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when we do hear from the government ha how successful we are with our monetary mm -hmm. ask of £50 million over three years. Uh, I understand what you say. Um, perhaps you and I, perhaps I'll take you by the hand and take you on a bus one day before too long. How about that? Is, how about that for an offer? So, You're on, actually, uh, well, we'll, we'll see what that. we can do. But, uh, <laughs> uh, as to the passenger focus group, um, I can't just wheel off all the names of people, I'm afraid, but I'm happy to supply those to you by email, if, you, if you'll allow me to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Councillor Wellham. Thank you. Um, I used to be a bus, uh, a bus passenger until they took the buses away. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I welcome back more buses so I can get back on the bus to get to the station. Um, in 2019, the administration removed bus subsidies on 23 routes. Would these be considered for reinstatement? Are they part of the 
the thinking that you have. Um, because rural bus services would bring passengers to feed what you've listed as the key corridors. So did the assessment of the likely uptake on the key corridors take account of this potential and what will be done to provide these services to link into the key corridors? Um, and I don't understand why Bury St Edmunds to Newmarket is a key corridor. Uh, and there must be a reason for it, but it has a reliable train service. Um, so I don't understand why that is a, a, a key corridor. Um, Councillor Willem, the, the, the general practice is you get three questions. So oh, that's my first one. Well, I think that was two. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have one more, then we'll come to other colleagues and then come back to you at the end if you have more okay. questions. Okay. Um, the key to bus timetable reliability is bus priority measures. Um, and will you have an, an oven ready set of schemes to be implemented as soon as funding is agreed and will funding from other sources be needed and will there be a process of um, all, members feed, all members feeding into that to help with the year two bid? Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, I don't think I'm going to uh, try and answer them all because You've made the point, and as they say, there are officers behind me who are listening to what you're saying. And at this moment, I'm not going to rule anything in or anything out. It comes down to the fact that of our £50 million ask of this government over the next three years, how much they actually pledge to give us. But yes, we will need bus priority measures, and we will need to implement those. But I can't say to you that they will all be implemented on the 1st of April next year because things like bus lanes obviously take longer to do than that because it is necessary to consult and do all other kinds of things. Now, we did mention key corridors, which is an idea of what we are looking at at the moment. Uh, and I, I, I listened to what you say, and indeed Woodbridge Town Council wrote me a letter saying that they wanted me to know that their view was that every single village in Suffolk should have an hourly bus service. Well, you know, we don't live in utopia, I'm afraid. I wish we did, but there are over 500 villagers in Suffolk, and that's not going to be possible. But I do hope that we will be able to um, uh, increase the number of services, some new ones, and perhaps increase the frequency where we can to make them more attractive. But that is something that we will be doing progressively over the next few months. We're much more at the higher principles at the moment before we get into the detail. But your points would have been noted to go Thank into you. the discussion. Thanks very much. OK, next up is Councillor Faircloth Mutton. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Smith, I was delighted to see on page 38 that Sudbury will be included in the Bus Rail Integrated Ticketing Scheme. It's nice. Um, the residents in my division will be able to take full advantage of that. There are commuters um, in my area, but also uh, to London and up to Bury St Edmunds. So I think that's a wonderful move forward. Uh, my question is centred on the, uh, the fueling of the buses, um, particularly by the bus companies that we've tended um, to run our bus operations. Our colleagues in Baber and Mid Suffolk have um, just become the first councils in rural England to run 90% of their dust cart collection service on hydro treated vegetable oil. Has the council already, or will consider in the future if it hasn't done so already, consider uh, making um, a similar incentivisation? Uh, with our buses in the way that our rural colleagues have done in the middle of the county. Thank you. Thank you for your comments about Sudbury. I feel very much the same about Saxmundham, where I live. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we've got to be fair, and I, I hope that the extra money coming in uh, will benefit rural areas as much as it benefits urban areas. I think that's an important thing to say. As to future fueling of, of, of buses, yes, I think we're moving perhaps towards... Uh, hydrogen buses, but they won't be cheap, and whether we'll be able to supply some subsidies to bus companies to buy new stock uh, might be a possibility. Could Mr. Stevenson perhaps just give me a, a helping hand there? What Absolutely. It forms one of the cornerstones mm. of uh, the bus back better um, principle um, to reduce carbon, so it, it's within there, it's within our plan to do that. So 
Um, there are lots of government initiatives out at the moment. One called Zebra. I can only remember the first three letters, but it's zero emission buses. Um, and so th that's just one of a number of streams that are around at the moment. More about electrification. Um, and if one looks at, at other areas that have moved into um, low carbon, like the city of Glasgow, for example, or the city of Birmingham, um, th there's also options to retrofit. But it is expensive, as, as Councillor Smith says. And we need to be mindful of that when we put our bid in. Thank you. I hope that's a sufficient answer. It's something that we will definitely be considering. That's good to hear. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, may I start by welcoming this whole paper and congratulate Councillor Smith and the officers and your various partners, the amount of work that you've done between now between um, middle of the summer and now at this point in time. Um, I welcome the comment about the urban um, rural balance and I'd be interested to know what criteria you will be using to actually get that balance which is satisfactory to both parties. But, and secondly, um, in South Suffolk it's probably a little bit thin in terms of its comments and I was a bit disappointed that in the whole of South Suffolk, there is not a specific um, corridor um, highlighted or a key corridor mentioned. Um, could I ask that you perhaps reconsider that? And secondly, consider what uh, collaboration and discussions you've had with um, Essex County Council, They're obviously in South Suffolk, we're on the county boundary, um, to actually make sure that both both counties are singing from the same hymn sheet. Uh, just, just to point out, Mid Suffolk's not mentioned either, Councillor Finch. So I, we can all find fault in the uh, documentation. Uh, just to warn you, <laughs> this is this is a high-level paper. As I say, the detail will come in the third paper, probably at the March cabinet meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you approved of my ambition about the rural-urban split. We'll have to see, ultimately, what money we get and how best we can spend that. But I, I, I really want that to happen. And I understand about South Suffolk. I mean, it's a beautiful area. Um, and, you know, like everywhere else, I'm sure you could do with uh, more bus services. Um, Cross-border issues. You mentioned about Essex. Cross-border issues are important because, obviously, we have buses going south into Essex west into Cambridgeshire and, and, and north into Norfolk. Uh, I understand that will all work fairly smoothly, but again, can I ask uh, Mr Stevenson just to comment on that, please, cross-border? We, uh, we meet with our colleagues regularly. We're aware of their BSIP. They are aware of ours. We have reciprocal arrangements for cross-boundaries. Buses don't recognise boundaries, as Councillor Smith says. Our last meeting with F Essex and Norfolk was at 2 o'clock yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lockington. Uh, th thank you, Chair. And can I just explain the reason why Councillor uh, Wellham had lots of questions is because, of course, with COVID, some of our councillors have decided that they would not uh, do the journey and come down, so they have handed a few questions to the rest of us. So I've got one which maybe sounds strange for me because it's about Halesworth. And will you consider Halesworth's Bungie Noids as a key priority for students who live in Halesworth? And it's also linked with the high schools in uh, Bungie and the further education in Noids. So that's linked to the cross border. And will you consider a link, preferably via electric bus from Halesworth's uh, rail station to South World? And I think it may be better than lowest of these. Um, um, uh, questions come from one of my uh, com fellow county counters. I think I can guess who of. it is, actually. Um, <laughs> so, um, number three is for myself, and um, it's uh, wonderful to see this paper because that was really what was missing with the walking and cycling. Um, so, I really um, am happy to see the bus back better because many of us were able to walk or cycle and that way help with the COVID situation. But people who cannot do that, they really need their buses. And one of the things, because I took time to read through the government's paper, and one of the things that says in there, they drive pensioners to see their friends. 
and as we've talked about before, they should be accessible and inclusive by design for, disa for disabled people. So there is a lot here, and I hope as we go forward, we will really do that so that all our buses can be used by everybody, because if things are accessible for disabled people, they are far easier for me to get on and off. So uh, is that something? And I hope, um, Councillor Smith, that you will again involve councillors in the next stage before you send the next paper in, in the spring. Thank you. Uh, well, I did promise that last point in, in what I had to say. Um, I, I'm grateful for your comments, uh, Councillor Lockington. Um, yes, buses should be more accessible. Of course they should. But they ha you know, we have to do it as resources allow. We haven't, we, as I said before, we, we, we're not in a utopian situation. But what you say is, I think, widely accepted. Um, the, the other points, particularly about Halesworth, Bungay, Norwich, I do know of the problems there, because I've already been lobbied on them. Uh, about the need, if you're going from Hellsworth to Norwich, to change at Bungay, and there's a, quite a wait there. Uh, it didn't used to be the case, it is now, and that's something that officers will again look at to see if it can be improved. I make no promises because it's wrong of me to make promises at this stage, but we will come back at the next Cabinet paper with, with, with various proposals. The final point is about the electric bus to Southwold. Well, we have this experimental service at the moment called Catch, with a K, which starts at Camp Seas Railway Station, Wickham Market as it's called, into the town of Wickham Market and up to Halesworth. It's more than halfway through, it's six, uh, to, to Framingham, I'm sorry, to Framingham, thank you. Um, it's more than halfway through its experimental period and we need to look at the conclusions of, uh, of how, how that has gone, but it does provide a very interesting and useful template for the future. And I agree that one of the uh, services that might be suitable for such a bus would be between Halesworth and Southwold. Thank you very much. Councillor Vigo de Galadora. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, one of the things that struck me about our bus services is from Lowestoft, we have over four buses an hour during the day that go to the county town of Norfolk, to Norwich. Some fast, some go through the villages. And it's They're the X2 and X3, aren't they? <laughs> I <laughs> Sorry? Think I think they're, called, they're numbered the X2 and the X3. Yes, and also the A146 uh -oh. as well. <laughs> um, but we have no buses going from Lowestoft to Ipswich, let alone Saxmundham. <laughs> um, and that A12 route is really something which should be part of our bus service. Uh, it enables uh, local historians to get down to the hold for a start and it means that we have that contact with Ipswich Hospital where that's called in for various um, needs of the local people. So I would ask that, that some route, even if you have to change en route, be considered because it's vital uh, if we're to be self-sufficient in Suffolk. Well, I remember when there was a bus service between Ipswich, Saxmundham and Lowestoft, and that now has not been in place for a few years. As I say, I'm making no uh, commitments, but I am asking officers to listen carefully to what people are saying and to see if we can address these issues. Uh, I, I, I realise um, uh, what you're saying and the reason why you're saying it, but at the moment I won't make any firm commitments. But what you say is being noted. Thank you. I, I have everyone that's been once that wanted to go, so we'll go for round. Did you want? To, did, did I miss anyone out on round one? No. So round two. So we're going round again. Uh, sorry. Um, more commit. More requests for more bus routes. I suspect, Councillor Smith, uh, Councillor Martin, then Councillor Wellham. Yeah. Well, I, I, as an Ipswich councillor, I, I do need to make a plea. Uh, that we try to make sure that the, what we're doing with the buses actually matches what people are prepared to do and want to do. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting that all in prior to uh, the policy development panel, which I'm, I'm glad to say I will be sitting on. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, just say something about Halesworth, because of course I used to live in Halesworth and my family still do. Um, and the bus used to run from Southwold to Norwich via Halesworth and Bungie, which was really helpful because the trains actually meet 
at Halesworth Station. So you can, the bus can pull into Halesworth and actually pick up people going in both directions, both to Lowestoft and to uh, Ipswich, and then carry on to Norwich. It means that if Southwell people can go to Norwich, it means that Halesworth people can go to Norwich, it means that Bungie people can go to Ipswich, it means that Southwell people can go to Ipswich, all with one bus service. I'm not at all clear why it stopped. I think it was something to do with what first group thought they could make the most profits out of. But it would be very, very helpful, I think, for everybody if it could be a single service from Southwold to Norwich via Halesworth. I, I don't claim to know Halesworth as, as, as well as you do, uh, Councillor Martin, although uh, my division goes up to Bramfield, just one mile from Halesworth, and I do know the town fairly well. And as I say, I am aware of the issues there. So again, I ask officers to note what you have said for the forthcoming discussions. Thank you. Councillor Wellham. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, my question is around bus passes. It's not about Stow Upland again. Um, you, you, there must be some sort of um, financial model that, that this is gonna, all going to work to. I wonder what would happen if you've got lots and lots of uh, extra passengers and nearly all of them are using bus passes because um, that's going to cost the county more. It would be far better if there were more and more people who don't have bus passes using the buses. Um, so that, that, that is a, a concern. The other thing about lots and lots of people with bus passes using buses is that a number of them will have shopping trolleys and all sorts of odd, odd devices to help them walk along the street. Um, and the bus that's nearest to where I live will only accept one shopping trolley. So if you're second in line with a shopping trolley, you, got, you don't get on, and that's, that, it's a worry that, that people might not use the buses if they can't accommodate all of the people, that, all of the types of people, ability and disability, who want to use it. We are getting into quite a level of detail here, which this paper, as, uh, as I state again, is, is fairly high level. Uh, and all I can say, and, and this is not meant to be trite, is that officers are listening to what's being said, and, and, and I've noted what, what you're saying. Uh, I don't know the answer about uh, the financial model and the number of people who use bus passes and those who pay the full fare, or a variation of, of that full fare. Uh, I will ask officers about that. Uh, we are reimbursed to a certain extent by the government for free bus passes, but certainly not to 100%. But um, what I can say is the issues you're raising will be recorded and we will consider them over the course of the coming months. Okay, I've got no other hands up. So thank you very much for all the questions. Um, Councillor Smith, I'd just ask you to summarise and remind Cabinet what we're being asked to decide today, please. Well, thank you, Chairman. On page 28 of the papers, uh, we're being asked to decide paragraphs 12, 13 and 14 which is to acknowledge and agree to the headline asks an order of costs contained in the proposed BSIP as set out in this report, to delegate final development, including costings, and the submission of the BSIP to the Executive Director for Growth, Highways and Infrastructure in consultation with the Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Transport Strategy and Waste by the end of October 2021, and to note that a further Cabinet paper on the enhanced partnership arrangements will be provided prior to its submission in March 2022. Okay, thank you very much. Cabinet, are we in favour of the recommendation that's just been read out? Can we have a show of hands, please? Yes, that's unanimous. Great, thank you very much. Okay, well, that's the end of business for today's meeting. The next um, meeting is Tuesday, the 9th of November um, at 2 o'clock. If I can just remind councillors, please, to take all belongings, paperwork and rubbish with us and could you take your uh, microphone smart card and put them in the collection box uh, by the exit? Uh, sorry? Okay, the box isn't quite there. It'll be there in a second. Um, and can you take your nameplate and put it on the table outside as well? And thank you very much. <laughs>